The record temperatures in Europe over the last few weeks would not have been possible without man-made climate change. The United Nations Secretary General says the world is heading for a catastrophe unless climate change is prioritized. To Europe and the polar regions were the areas hardest hit by severe temperature changes caused by climate change just last year. The exponential rise in human pressures on planet Earth has now reached a stage where we have now created our own geological epoch. Now, a new study says that catastrophic climate change outcomes, including human extinction, are not being taken seriously enough by scientists. Ultimately, the emergency climate comes down to a single number. The concentration of carbon in our atmosphere. We face a direct existential threat. Pretending that climate change wasn't real would somehow make it go away. Humans, who are an animal species, among others, could be capable of changing the Earth's climate. Time is running out. Scotland, a relatively small country, led the world into the Industrial Age and is now helping to power the world into the net zero age. Climate change is a word we are probably all very familiar with these days, yet the understanding of the issue differs from individual to individual. From avid activists... All we have to do is to wake up and change. ...to fly out climate change deniers. You'd have to show me the scientists because they have a very big political agenda. I'm sure most of us have heard a few different opinions on the causes or perhaps even existence of global warming. A lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? But what if I was to tell you that in a short study of the Murray Firth, we can find evidence of climate change and what we can expect to see with rising global temperatures. This documentary is going to investigate the impacts of climate change on environments and communities around the Murray Firth. From coastal erosion, flooding drainage basins and risks to food and energy security, we investigate how the future looks like a tough and challenging task to adapt and mitigate the impacts. We are aiming to transition to net zero emissions in Scotland for the benefit of our environment, our people and our prosperity as a nation. It's clear we need to adapt and build resilience to the impact of climate change alongside our actions to reduce emissions. And many of the people and businesses around the Murray Firth are doing just that. The populations in the Highlands, Murray and North Aberdeenshire might be small in comparison to the behemoth urban centres of London or even Glasgow. But our positioning on the Earth's surface and the natural features we have in abundance puts us in a unique position to lead the line in the fight in tackling climate change. Climate is the word used to describe the average weather, for example temperature or rainfall, collectively taken over a period of time. Climate change is a term used to describe the long-term shift in climate patterns. We know from the geological record that there has been variations in the Earth's climate over thousands and millions of years. However, recent change is faster than anything seen before. In fact, the evidence shows that the world's climate is undoubtedly changing. Since the late 1800s, our atmosphere and ocean have warmed, amounts of snow and ice have decreased, and the sea level has risen as consequence. So, what's caused this? Well, since the Industrial Revolution, human populations have been releasing increased amounts of greenhouse gases into the air. For most of the past 800,000 years, much longer than human civilization has existed, the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere was between 200 and 280 parts per million. In other words, there were 200 to 280 molecules of the gas per million molecules of air. But since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, that concentration has jumped to more than 400 parts per million, driven up by human activities. The higher concentrations of greenhouse gases, and carbon dioxide in particular, is causing extra heat to be trapped and global temperatures to rise. Now it's worth noting that the natural cycles such as changes in the strength of the sun and the orbit of the earth, as well as volcanic eruptions affect the temperature of the earth. However, the rapid change in climate seen over the last 250 years cannot be explained by these natural cycles alone, but can be explained by a combination of natural and human-made impacts. The science on the human contribution to modern warming is quite clear. Human emissions and activities have caused around 100% of the warming observed since 1950, according to the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, this assessment. 
Natural variability in the Earth's climate is unlikely to play a major role in long-term warming, and it really is up to us now to make the changes necessary to make a difference. Uh, my name is Crawford Paris. I work for Aberdeenshire Council and I am the Sustainability and Climate Change Officer. Hello, my name is George and I'm a Climate Change Strategy Officer at Murray Council. I'm Neil Osborne and I'm the Climate and Energy Team Manager for Highland Council. Uh, hi there, my name is Ben Lyshen. I work for Nature Scott and I'm Operations Manager covering the Highland area. Climate change is already having some major impacts across the region. We're experiencing changing weather events. Um, we're experiencing um, times of drought, times of flooding, uh, coastal erosion and on all of thing, these things are having a dramatic impact now and they're likely to get worse. Some of the climate change impacts that we're seeing already here in Murray include changes in our rainfall patterns. Predictability of weather patterns and how coastal processes will be affected by them is becoming increasingly difficult to, to model and understand. Getting a lot more intense rainfall. Um, so we've seen increased flood events and um, some serious flood events across Murray happening already. Storms, we can see things like coastal erosion, coastal flooding um, and possibly seeing um, more drought conditions in the summer. Which pose a serious risk to our food and drink industry. Various weather patterns that are having an impact on how we can produce energy and as a region we need to start to adapt and understand where that's going to move. Later rainfall as well can also contribute to uh, poorer soil qualities and peatland degradation which are huge issues. With these changing coastal processes it means that the wildlife, uh, the plants, the animals uh, and the habitats that live and are on the coast um, are having to adapt and change to the changing um, weather patterns as well. Just recently we had Storm Arwen in November 2021 uh, that really hit the northeast of Scotland hard. We saw huge uh, wind numbers um, from the northeast, uh, which was not the prevailing wind direction. Some of the other impacts that we're experiencing here in Murray include increased sea levels. Murray has many coastal towns and villages, and these are negatively impacted by uh, rising sea levels, high tides, and um, coastal erosion as well. So I think we can expect um, changes to our coastal erosion, coastal accretion, the way that uh, sediments move around the coast. Seeing a number of pressures on some of the coastal species, many other bird species as well are changing their migration patterns and movements because of the changing weather patterns. Um, there'll be impacts on other things as well, fish, uh, marine mammals, which we're trying to understand. But the one thing that we can say is that if we've got um, a resilient and a healthy um, environment, then it's more able to adapt to the changing weather patterns. As mentioned, one of the main impacts of climate change on the Murray Firth communities will come from changes in weather patterns, specifically higher precipitation levels that will be catalysed by rising sea levels. The Scottish Environmental Protection Agency have interactive flood maps available on the website that paint quite a worrying picture for many of the areas around the Murray Firth coastline. With the blue areas indicating river flood risks that are calculated as 10% likely, and the purple detailing surface water risks of the same magnitude. It doesn't take long to scroll through and see the vast areas that are at risk. As seen here, the areas at risk of flooding are identified right through the coastline, with many coastal communities at risk. Climate change will also influence Scotland's capacity to generate weather-dependent renewable energy. For example, varying water ability will affect hydro generation schemes. Climate change can also impact power distribution, with impacts ranging from damage caused by extreme weather events to reduced transmission efficiency occurring as a result of temperature fluctuations. Impacts on global energy markets may also affect energy supplies in Scotland and consequently our overall energy security. Climate change may also have an impact on global food production. Although Scotland may be able to grow more food, this will not offset the impact global disruption has on us. And as our climate warms and rainfall patterns change, there may be an increased competition for water between households, agriculture, industry and the needs of natural environment. Summer droughts may become more frequent and more severe, causing problems for water quality and supply. Over the last 30 years, average temperature in Scotland has risen by 0.5 degrees Celsius. Scottish winters have become 5% wetter and sea level around the Scottish coast has increased by up to 3 centimetres each decade. Further climate change in Scotland is now inevitable, no matter how rapidly global greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. Some impacts of climate change on changes in global sea level and ice sheets are now effectively irreversible on a human timescale. The amount of change we see will depend on how successful we are in reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. 
The goal of the 2015 Paris Agreement was to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, preferably to 1.5 degrees compared to pre-industrial revolution levels. Global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius will be exceeded during the 21st century, unless there are deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions in the coming decades. Globally, the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions are electricity and heat, making 31%, agriculture 11%, transportation 15%, forestry 6%, and manufacturing with 12 Energy production of all type accounts for 72% of all emissions. But renewables generate almost all of Scotland's electricity, mostly from the country's wind power. In fact, in 2020, Scotland produced over 97% of their electricity needs from renewables. And the best part is, they're showing no signs of slowing down. With further focus on utilising the wave power that Scotland has in its coastlines and the introduction of two new green freeports, one with right here in the Cromarty Firth, we have an abundance of potential to be a driver of change. That's not to mention the fact that we have the first manufacturer of solar thermal collectors in Western Europe based right here in the Murray Firth. Some might say we're in a very good position in terms of energy production, but things can be a little more complicated than they seem. What we need to understand is that climate change is happening now. How we choose to respond won't just affect the survival of individual species or our distinctive landscapes. Climate change impacts will also affect our economy, our culture and our lifestyles. Climate change is the single greatest threat to Scotland's habitats. Whether they're found on the mountain tops or on our seabeds, climate change will alter the intricate ecological balances that let plants and animals grow and thrive. Increasing ocean temperatures and ocean acidification are the main consequences of climate change and rising CO2 levels on the marine environment. These warming seas cause further catastrophic changes, like rising sea levels and loss of polar ice. Scotland's nature and landscapes are vital to many sectors of our economy, and these may be affected by climate change impacts, food and energy security, water quality and availability, flood risks, cultural heritage, recreation and human health are all likely to be affected. Although this all may sound very negative and a bleak outlook for the future, there are significant efforts ongoing to adapt and mitigate all of these impacts. And this is where the communities around the Murray Firth are leading the line. I think the communities around the, the inner Murray Firth are well positioned on the journey to a tackling climate change. There is a, a big piece of work that we need to do in terms of building that understanding and behavioural change. I think the region is positioned to tackle climate change uh, really well. Um, it's very positive. We have a huge focus on collaboration between uh, the public, private uh, and communities. Communities have got a vital role to play in addressing climate change. Um, the people that live and work by the sea are the ones that notice the changes, they're the ones that see what's happening um, with changing climate and they're also the ones that are probably most affected by climate change as well. I think Murray's very well placed to offer the solutions necessary to cut carbon emissions and protect and restore nature. We have both the natural capital here, both at land and sea, but also have the human resources as well um, and, and the wherewithal to develop these solutions and crucially to take action and, and implement them. The Highland Council are currently developing a net zero strategy for the region. It's our chance to, to give some evidence-based understanding as to where we are currently, what the goals need to be going forward and how we can move forward as a region to achieve our goals. Aberdeenshire Council has a, a new pollinator action plan. Um, this is to look at the threats, uh, identify the threats that are currently facing pollinating uh, insects in the region. Um, and that includes uh, the threats that we are seeing um, already from climate change. Um, also related to this work, we have green space project officers and their role is to look at council owned land and see how that could be improved uh, to encourage greater biodiversity and a network of biodiversity across the region. The Council has a significant role in tackling climate change. Collectively, local authorities are responsible for 2% of direct national emissions, but have an influence over 33% of national emissions. Um, so that's in terms of what we do, um, what we buy and who we buy from. So whilst climate change is a global issue, um, it's in our local communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, at home with our families and community groups that the impacts of climate change will be most felt, um, but also where I believe the solutions lie. So the Council is very much on the front line in terms of tackling climate change, um, both in demonstrating leadership, but also in working with our communities to tackle a climate emergency. The Council has its climate change declaration, um, which essentially 
is uh, stating its carbon emissions reduction uh, targets um, as a headline. So we have uh, an uh, emissions reduction of 75% uh, to 2030. And then beyond that, we have a, a final target of net zero uh, to 2045. We also have our um, carbon, carbon budget. We were the first local authority in Scotland uh, to set out a carbon budget, and that was in 2017. The Council's got a role in, within the region in terms of trying to, to bring parties together across the region as we start to develop a strategy to deliver net zero. Now, there's a project called Dynamic Coast and it's a really interesting piece of work um, that's pretty groundbreaking um, in Scotland actually and what it's doing is it's modelling the effects of sea level rise on our coasts in Scotland and um, it's produced a series of detailed maps which show uh, likely coastal erosion and accretion based on different climate scenarios so kind of a low, a medium and a high emission scenario and it really helps to understand how the coasts are likely to change, you know, whether we meet the 1.5, the 2 or higher um, targets. And, and it's all modelled and it's all available online. Um, and you can see what will or is likely to happen to the area of coasts near you. I think a big part of what we're looking at is how we develop that partnership working. One of the best examples at the moment is the work that we've got ongoing with Highland Adapts. Highland Council, one of the, the founding partners of the the current stream of work that we're looking at, which is taking the adaptation message to communities across the region. Um, well, we recognise climate change as being a major driver for biodiversity loss, and we see the nature crisis, in other words, the loss of biodiversity and the climate emergency as being intri intricately um, connected. I think what needs to change is a shift on how we view and value our resources. We need to act and we need to act now and we need to recognise that nature has got a crucial role to play in dealing with a climate emergency. My name is Tom Bannerman, I'm the Adorno Conservation Officer with the Marine Conservation Society based here at Glen Laundry Distillery. ADEEP was well created in 2014. It's a partnership between the um, Marine Conservation Society, Herrick Watt University um, and Glen Laundry Distillery. The aim of the project is to simply reduce the environmental impact of the production of whisky here at Glenmorangie through the reintroduction of native European oysters. But we're trying to increase the native European population of oysters up to around 4 million by 2030. So over the last 12 months uh, we've increased the population to around 60,000, um, which has been a huge step. So um, outside of just deployment of oysters, we're actually looking at um, how we can better educate people around the area, so that's all the way from Dornach all the way through to Inverness, and that's just understanding what people want from this project. How they want to get involved, and how do they do it? Our work here um, can mitigate climate change in three kind of key methods. One is that oysters um, are really good at filtering water. Uh, one oyster, when we deploy into the Dornach Firth, will filter roughly 200, 200 litres of water every day. When we upscale one oyster all the way to 4 million, which we believe is our uh, kind of stable population estimate by 2030, um, the volume of water that will be filtered out is roughly 800,000 cubic metres, which is a huge amount. As well as obviously water quality, um, we have biodiversity. So when we deploy oysters, they essentially make a reef. That reef then essentially creates like a 3D city-like structure. By doing so, it can allow small animals, organisms to actually and use that area or that reef as like a safe haven. That in itself should increase biodiversity, as well as the fact we have a hard substrate in an area that's quite silty and quite sandy. So the kind of third way that oysters can combat uh, climate, climate change is that they can actually store carbon. So we're currently undergoing research with Harry Watt University to understand how much carbon they can store. And we believe it's roughly net zero, because obviously they're respiring, but they'll be putting um, carbon from the water column into the seabed. I think what we need to be doing is carrying on with the current research and our current projects. We've seen a massive increase in reservation projects over the last 10 years, and um, maybe off the back and deep, we don't know, um, but we've seen a huge increase in oyster restoration, for example. I think if we just keep in our trajectory um, in restoration within the UK, then I think that will be noticed across Europe and across the world, and 
one restoration project project at a time. Projects like the DEEP project are not just essential in tackling the climate crisis, but the biodiversity crisis too. More restoration projects are popping up across the Murray Firth and all across Scotland as efforts increase to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Several of these mitigation projects are coming from local people committing to community action projects. Local communities taking action like this is integral in our efforts to limit the impact we have on our planet. And restoration projects are not the only way our communities are taking responsibility. I am Joan Laurie and I am the manager of the Highlands and Islands Climate Hub. The Highlands and Islands Climate Hub um, is funded by the Scottish Government. Um, we are one of the first to form a network of climate hubs across um, Scotland and we are there to support community organisations and communities um, in taking out community-led climate action in their areas. So we support um, in all forms from design, development and delivery of climate action projects. The Highlands and Islands Climate Hub's um, role in tackling climate change is um, getting communities to be responsive to the climate emergency. We consider community organisations, community groups, leaders within communities to be influencers as well. If we can get community organisations to be setting an example as to how they behave and how they're tackling the climate crisis, we hope that that will then filter down to individual behaviour as well and can have an impact on the private sector and the public sector at the same time. So the, the biggest ongoing effort that I can um, mention at the moment is the work of Highland Adapts. Um, Highland Adapts are a partnership organisation um, between Highland Council, Nature Scott, the Highlands and Islands Climate Hub, um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and many more um, who are looking at specifically adaptation across the region. Um, the key work that Highland Adapts have ongoing currently is actually forming and um, working with Adaptation Scotland and Sniffer um, a climate risk assessment for all of Highland. We need to understand first and foremost how we need to adapt in the Highland area um, and what mitigation efforts are then going to be needed. The Highland Community Waste Partnership is a network of 10 organisations across the Highlands and Islands who are looking at how the Highlands area can reduce waste and move to a more circular economy. Um, all of the groups that are taking part in it have been previously funded by the Scottish Government Climate Challenge Fund. So they're all groups that have been experienced in climate action. Community organisations are looking to, not just in their own communities, look at how we can move to a more circular economy, how, can we re how we can reduce waste, but they're actually looking to, over the three years, take all of that learning and then assist other communities throughout the region. One specific action that gives me hope is how progressive we are in Scotland. We still have some work to do, but compared to other nations, we are much more progressive in Scotland. Programmes of learning focused on conservation and environmental education have been shown to enhance environmental attitudes, values and knowledge, as well as build skills to prepare individuals and communities to collaboratively undertake positive environmental action. Our knowledge on climate change is constantly developing, and in more recent years the understanding of how nature regulates our climate has become clearer. To be able to adapt as a society and really fight to tackle the climate crisis, Education programmes such as WDC's Green Whale Project are vitally important. Hi, my name is Alice Walters and I'm the Shorewatch Data Coordinator for Whale and Dolphin Conservation. So WDC is the world's leading charity dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins and porpoises. WDC's Green Whale Project is really talking about how whales play a vital role in maintaining ocean health and functioning just by going about their daily lives. So whales have an integral role in the biodiversity of our oceans and they can also fix and store and sequester carbon which helps us in our tackling of climate change. It's only in the recent decade or so that we're starting to understand the essential role that whales and dolphins are playing in ocean biodiversity and health. So the first aim of the Green Whale Project is really to cement this understanding and we're funding research that's looking to quantify the positive impacts that whales and dolphins are having on ocean health. So whales and dolphins help to improve the biodiversity of the ocean and also reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere just by going about their daily lives. One of the important ways they do this is by helping nutrients to circulate through different depths in the water and across huge ocean basins as they migrate from the polar north where the feeding is good into the tropical zones. So when whales dive down deep to feed, they have to come to the surface to breathe because like us, they're air breathing mammals. But when they get up to the surface, they also defecate or poo. And this whale poop is actually really rich fertilizer for phytoplankton. 
Phytoplankton are tiny oceanographic plants that live at the surface of the water and they draw carbon out of the atmosphere and release oxygen back into the air in its place. And in turn, those phytoplankton are the base of the whole food web. So they act kind of like trees do in the ocean. When whales travel up to the polar latitudes, they feed during the summer months and they build up literally tons of blubber on their body. And then they migrate back down into the tropic regions where they nurse and breed. And during that time, they don't feed very much at all. So they process all of that blubber and again, release those nutrients into the water through their urine. And that can feed those phytoplankton blooms and also the, the nutrient depleted um, coral reef areas. And finally, whales store that carbon within their own bodies. And so at the end of its life, when a whale dies, it is most likely to sink down to the ocean floor. And we call this whale fall. And once a whale is below about a thousand meters, that carbon will remain trapped down at the bottom of the ocean for hundreds or even thousands of years. And not only that, it becomes an ecosystem, which is really important for all of those subsea species that are living down there on the bottom of the ocean. As a whole community and a whole world, we really need to tread more lightly and to appreciate the things that nature is giving us. As mentioned, the use of energy represents by far the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions from human activities. Electricity from renewable sources could provide 65% of the world's total electricity supply by 2030. It could also decarbonise 90% of global power sector by 2050, massively cutting carbon emissions and helping to mitigate climate change. Advancing our technology to harness renewable energy has an important part to play, and alongside our developments in wind and wave power, there's a lot of work going into harness the energy of the sun itself. My name is Kira Wright, I work for AES Solar uh, and my job is Graduate Apprentice Engineer. So AES Solar works to provide solar thermal, which is solar hot water, and solar PV, which is solar electricity, to domestic and commercial customers all across Scotland. Today we are the UK's only manufacturer for solar thermal collectors. The main goal of AES Solar on a day-to-day -day level is to be here for people to help them get on board with the solar journey and get a system installed for them that's going to work. Basically, the main goal is to get as many people as we can involved in solar production as it's helping on the road to net zero. So any AES Solar customer is positively impacting climate change by looking to produce clean green energy for their homes. So although we've always been kept very busy, we've seen an unprecedented amount of interest in solar around the Murray Firth at current due to the rising costs of living and the energy crisis. So solar energy is any kind of energy that is generated by the sun. The sun's energy can be harnessed by humans to create solar power. Solar energy is so important to help decarbonise the UK's power system and help us on the road to net zero. We've installed over 7,000 solar thermal panels during our history and over a million solar PV panels. This equates to 22,418 tonnes of carbon prevented from entering the atmosphere. To better understand the contribution we are making to sustainability, this equates to offsetting over 22,000 commercial transatlantic flights. So a few good examples we've got at the moment are Ben Romick Distillery, we also installed on the Murray Sports Centre in Elgin, as well as Keith Football Club. We've also installed hundreds of different commercial buildings and domestic households around the Murray Firth. If we are to be successful in tackling climate change, we must remember that energy is at the heart of the climate challenge and the key to the solution. So what can we do as individuals? Well to start, make your voice heard by those in power. Tell your member of parliament or local councillor that you think an action on climate change is important. Ultimately, steps to reduce carbon emissions will have a positive impact on local issues like improving air quality and public health, creating jobs and reducing inequality. Eat less meat and dairy. Avoid meat and dairy products is one of the biggest ways to reduce your environmental impact on the planet. Studies suggest that a high fiber plant-based diet is also better for your health, so it could be a win-win. Try to choose fresh seasonal produce that is grown locally to help reduce the carbon emissions from transportation, preservation and prolonged refrigeration. Cut back on flying. For the trips in the same country or continent, try to take a public transport option or renting an electric car. When flying is unavoidable, pay a little extra for carbon offsetting. Leave the car at home. Instead of getting in the car, walk or cycle and enjoy the physical and mental health benefits. Reduce your energy use and bills. Small changes to your behaviour at home will help you use less energy, cutting your carbon footprint and your energy bills. Respect and protect green spaces. Green spaces such as parks and gardens are important. 
They absorb carbon dioxide and are associated with lower levels of air pollution. Plant trees or create your own green space. Help to protect and conserve green spaces like local parks, ponds or community gardens. Invest your money responsibly. Banks often hold investments in fossil fuel companies. Cut consumption and waste. Everything we use as consumers has a carbon footprint. Avoid single use items and try not to buy more than you need. Shop around for second hand or quality items that last longer. Try to minimise your waste. Repair and reuse. Give unwanted items a new life by donating them to charity or selling them on. Avoid wasting food. Let brands know you think they're using too much for packaging. Some will take customer feedback seriously. And talk about the changes you make. Conversations are a great way to spread big ideas. As you make these positive changes to reduce your environmental impact, share your experience with your family, friends or customers or clients. If you think you're powerless against climate change and that one person can't make a difference, think again. While governments and private sector businesses do have the largest role to play in halting the change, individuals and communities can still make a hugely positive impact. It's up to us to make the difference. So one change I've made um, to my life um, to look kind of better accommodate the environment is to actually shop, uh, shop local produce. I'm very conscious about where I get my food and where it's come from, how it's been treated and buy local. I guess that's, that's my big steps. The small changes that I've made in my life start with dealing with food waste. Um, I went from a three-person household to children leaving home to a one-person household and I've had to really reclaim how I deal with food in my own home. Um, I've recently tried to take the train a lot more um, when I'm going on longer journeys and um, I find that far more relaxing but also it's far better for the environment as well. A small change I've made in my life recently is shopping at charity shops rather than buying clothes online. This helps reduce the carbon footprint and helps contribute to the circular economy. One of the small changes I've made in my life is to uh, be much more willing to speak to people, speak to everyone about the climate emergency and biodiversity loss, to try and raise awareness, increase understanding and hopefully change minds. Just being more aware of my diet and how I can improve that from a sustainability point of view. I've also been shopping more locally, looking at the more sustainable options. We all make small changes to make sure that we tread more lightly while we're here. And I have kids at home, so we try to have the conversation about the things that they can do in their daily life. Um, wear a sweater instead of turning up the heat, or we walk down to the school bus, which is about a half a kilometer away, even when it's raining, so that we don't have to use our car. But we also talk about the fact that not everything is within their control, and so they can also make changes to inform themselves and to add their voices to others to amplify it. So maybe attending a march or signing onto a petition and really becoming a movement of people that can impact systemic change.